I can also, oh, it's starting, okay. Welcome everyone. Welcome to another uh, Monday Fix with Dust Live. Uh, we uh, took a few Mondays off. Uh, we had a continuous programming every Monday for one year. And uh, so we, we are back after a two week break. And uh, we're very excited today because today we are going to be uh, discussing, uh, actually after a long time, we're discussing a book, uh, The Good Girls by Sonia Falero. Sonia Falero, uh, as Dust is a Goa based platform, we're very excited to have actually a Goan author uh, of international acclaim, uh, who's done some fantastic work as somebody I actually uh, have had the chance to interact with and know personally. Uh, Sonia Sonia's written a lot, uh, uh, and but, but Sonia's uh, most pioneering work for me has been her, her first book, The Be uh, Beautiful Thing, on uh, the, bar, uh, the Dance Bar Girls of Bombay. Um, and following that, Sonia has now done an incredible, incredible book, The Good Girls, about the harrowing, harrowing incident in Badao, in UP, uh, from 2014, where two young girls, teenage girls, were found hanging from a tree. And uh, and it's interesting because for me, uh, you know, for me, the, the Sonia's work in this book is fascinating because stories like this in India, in particular, get forgotten. They they sort of they, they become so they become so heavily part of our lives while they're in the media cycle, no matter how how deep and important they are. But the stories also get forgotten. The incidents get forgotten. We move on. And what Sonia's book has really done is created a permanent record of both the lives of Padma and Lali and celebrated their lives, but also really tried to explain the situation in a way that we rarely see in this kind of nonfiction investigative work that Sonia has done in the book. And I'm really, really excited to discuss it today. And as, as I was telling Sonia that I would like us discussion today for the next 45 minutes to really focus on the process of this sort of be, this book, you know, and, and, and not, of course, I don't want to give away the story because I really encourage everyone to read it. It's, I actually read it for the second time yesterday. It's just fantastic. And, uh, and very, very powerful. I mean, uh, and, uh, but, you know, and so Sonia, welcome to the show, Sonia. And I really wanted to ask you, Sonia, that, you know, 
how, you do explain this in the in in the book. You know, you were you would you you spent time in Delhi. You were deeply affected by Nirbhaya, like all of us were, right? The whole country was, and Nirbhaya sort of uh, kind of you know Nirbhaya stayed in the news for years, and you know it ch changed started a whole movement of rape law reform in, in a, another way. It was actually in a way it was a Mathura of 2012. And, uh, but I want to ask you, what was that moment for you when you read the Badao, when you started reading the Badao uh, story and you decided that, you know what, this is something that you needed to go actually and, and research further? Yeah, yeah. And look, firstly, thank you so much for having me. It's so great to see you after all these years. Um, so I think the actually my reaction to the Badanyu case goes, started with my response to uh, the case that we know of as the Nirbhaya case, which happened in December 2012. And I think that was one of those cases that, you know, was the, the biggest case of my lifetime, of my adulthood, certainly. And it, it, was, it was so shocking, so tragic. And I, I remember when she passed in a, a hospital bed in Singapore, seeing the news on my laptop. I was abroad at the time and just weeping. And, you know, this was not somebody that I knew. None of us, you, you didn't know her, presumably, and most of us didn't. But the way that we had come to know her made her so close to us um, and made a lot of us, a lot of women, I think, uh, who had grown up in India, certainly me, feel like, you know, we had a lot in common with her and, you know, that could have been us, but also just feeling like a kinship with this quite extraordinary young woman. She had an amazing, amazing story, as, as you would remember. And I think what happened after that was we were inundated with stories about reported rapes, which was a, a very important part of, I think, our growth as a country, uh, our growth as journalists, because now we were talking about sexual assault. And it just seemed like uh, th th these crimes were happening all around us. And we couldn't understand who these people were, why they weren't being caught, and why you couldn't put a stopper on, on these crimes. And so I started thinking about whether it was time to write a book about sexual assault, uh, partly as a way to process my own response to the Nir Nirbhaya case, partly as a way to process my own, uh, you know, adolescence in, in, in Delhi. And, and in fact, you know, my 20s were also um, extremely difficult because I had such concerns about personal safety, using public transport, working on, walking on a road, even during uh, broad daylight was uh, a scary, uh, frightening thing for me. And, and also partly as, um, as a way to, to, to just figure out who these people were and where the holes were in our system. You know, was it us as a culture? Was it our governance? Was it criminal justice? Where, was, where were we making lapses? And then, uh, uh, you know, here, then, then we were in the summer of 2014 and I was scrolling through Twitter and I saw the picture of the children uh, hanging from a tree. And, the children who I call Padma and Lali because I can't name them under Indian law were 16 and 14 when they were found hanging in a mango tree one morning in their village of Katra Sadatganj in Uttar Pradesh. And they had disappeared the previous night having gone to the fields uh, ostensibly to, you know, to, to use the toilet. And I mean, how would, can you get over an image like that? You know, like, how do you even, again, how do you process something like that? It's impossible to process a, a woman getting raped on a bus, a gang raped on a bus, mutilated. And now you have, we are supposed to process this image of, of children and, and not just process the image, hello, but process the sense of like, this is who we are. You know, I mean, this is us. It's okay. You can say, okay, no, it happened in Uttar Pradesh. It happened there. It's far away. But no, I mean, ultimately, these are, we are those people. You know, this is a collective failure as a culture. And again, the fact that they were kids and the fact that somebody thought it was okay to put the picture up, which we would never normally do. Who puts up pictures of, you first of all, you don't put up pictures of dead people on social media, it's just not done, right? Now we have that word triggering. We never used to use that word before. And we say things like trigger warning. In 2014, we didn't use such language. 
And in any case, like you wouldn't do it. But not only are you putting up pictures of dead people, they're kids. So there was also a question of like, it's really come to this, that somewhere somebody believed that if I don't put up the picture of the kids, nobody will respond. And this is a, a by the way, this reflects the response of the parents of Padma and Lali, who refused to let the bodies come down. Exactly. Their response was, if we bring down the bodies, it will be like this never happened. So whoever circulated, you know, I, I, we know who took that image. Uh, we don't know how it ended up on Twitter, but whoever did it, did it saying, look, people have to know. And it did elicit the response that, that those individuals wanted, which is that, you know, somebody like me looked at it and said, I mean, come on, how did this happen? So, right? And, so yeah, sorry. I mean, so just as we go further ahead, I mean, this is the interesting thing for me, though, right? Because I I love the beautiful thing. I mean, you know, when you wrote the beautiful thing, you had the characters you spend time with, you live, you hung out with. I remember, I remember that really lovely episode in it, and I actually found it today and I read it again when you go in the train to Mila Road with uh, Le uh, with uh, Leela, right? And and you're you're sort of like a little bit. You're like, oh my god, I'm sort of this urban cosmopolitan. <laughs> Uh, I've never really been to Mira Road and I'm going to Mira Road with her. Am I going to really s s stick out in the sore thumb? I mean, the kind of questions of an outsider ins insider that were bothering you at that time. And yeah. also the fact that you were really telling stories of people you were sort of spending time with. Just these are stories of people yeah. living around you. And for that experience to plunge into this task ahead of, that, that you undertook of telling the story of the good girls, you, you, you choose to tell a story of the girls who have actually gone. So, as you said, you know, we will, you, we will never meet these girls. What you create in the book, by the end of the book, I, and I think and every reviewer feels this. I mean, we all came out thinking we, just, we got to know Padma and Lali really well. You brought Padma and Lali alive. And I think for me, that was just incredibly beautiful. And I'm sure that can't be an easy task, Sonia. I mean, you know, maybe some, maybe if you can take us through some of that, you know, yeah, really yeah. that so, you know, um, you have to think about the environment that I was entering when I did uh, first visit Katra Sadat Ganj uh, one year later. I was living in London by then. I couldn't make it before that, but I made it in time for the first death anniversary of the children. And the, you know, the village is still in shock. Um, the village is still trying to process what had happened. Uh, and obviously the parents are suffering immense trauma and they have not had any time to, to really just even be alone with their thoughts because as soon as they found their children, and in fact, as soon as the children went missing, they, their quest for justice begins, right? Now, what is their quest for justice is, is something that we can also talk about, but the fact is that they were on a quest and that takes up literally all their time because people were treating uh, Katra and their house and they themselves as sort of characters in, in a reality show, you know, making them, uh, making Sohan Lal, who is the father of the, the younger girl, Lali, take photographs by the tree where his children were, where his daughter was found hanging, you know, making them pose with, with various accessories like the children's notebooks asking them the same question over and over again. So they haven't really had time to just be still and to think about their children. So there is, you're entering a situation of great trauma and suffering. And because they're, they're still on a quest, there are some things that they can say and there's some things that they won't say. Then you have the fact that, you know, Padma and Lali were teenagers, right? And I was an, an insufferable teenager who, couldn't give her parents a straight answer. I mean, I, I had two lives, you know, and I grew up in a liberal family where, yeah, I could have a straightforward conversation with my parents, I guess, depending on the situation. But, you know, at that age, kids, they are two people, right? Because, and it's just a natural part of your development. You're, you're trying to be an independent person and that means cutting off ties for a certain period of time, right? So, their parents were in that position where there were some things they could not say to me and there are some things that they did not know in the way that all parents don't completely know their teenagers, simply that. So, you know, one of the things that I found really poignant was the, the, their determination to keep saying to me they loved school and they wanted to be doctors. 
They were good and girls. They were good girls. And the, this is something else they picked up from the Nirbhaya case because the, the young woman in the Nirbhaya case was a doctor. She was, quote unquote, a good girl. And let's be very honest, one of the reasons that a lot of people cared that we lost her was because we felt this is a, a, a productive citizen by, in, in, by the standards of how Indians judge productivity. You know, doctor, engineer, right? And she was in that category. This is the lesson, another lesson that the Shakya family absorbed. But the fact is that Padma didn't like school. Lali didn't want to be a doctor. And in fact, the family themselves had taken Padma out of school. And the family themselves were knew that their kids would not have whatever future their kids had imagined for them, for themselves. They knew that, right? But they felt they had to tell me this. And I completely understand it, right? Obviously they said what they felt would encourage people to continue reporting about the story, but it does actually one of the most moving falsehoods that I've heard in, in the process of reporting this book. And so, you know, in normal circumstances, if you ask a parent, what is your 14 year old like, they're not going to be able to give you a very good answer, you know, but in these circumstances, they really couldn't give me anything that I could use as a reporter. And when you want to find out uh, about what a teenager is like, you go to the teenager's friends. Exactly. That's really the first place you start. I mean, that intimacy that they share with their friends you know, their hopes, their dreams, that is only their friends know. And what happened in the case of these kids was that uh, in, in the weeks prior to their death, they received a visitor in the form of a younger cousin called Manju, who was 12 at the time. And Manju lives in Noida with her family. And Manju was 12, you know, Padma was 16, Lali 14. So Manju was a kid nobody wanted around because she hadn't made that transition from kid to, you know, sort of like a, a young woman. She was considered a pain. And uh, Padma and Lali would keep trying to sort of get rid of her the way one, one tries to swat a fly. But Lali, like all, uh, but uh, Manju, cousin Manju, like all 12 year olds, you know, had an antenna. And she followed the kids, her followed the teenagers, and she saw things and heard things. And then ultimately with them, she experienced things. So cousin Manju was a very, very important source of information, or information of the sense of, you know, what does it mean to be a teenager? That kind of, you know, that sense, the yearning. Then the fact is that the kids, they didn't have a lot to look forward to, yeah. you know? I mean, they were teenagers, they had a mobile phone, they could graze the goats, they loved gossiping, and they wanted to go to the mela that takes place once a year. I love I love the one scene where one of the cousins comes back with uh, with, the, with the parents of the shopping from from another town and they open up the suitcase and they are just completely taken by all the shopping and all the clothes in it and yeah. sort of, you know I mean all the fabric and the and the texture of the fabric it just transports them to another world somewhere else where all the stuff is being sold it's just fascinating you know yeah yeah and there was cousin Manju yeah. there was Manju with yeah, her you know skinny Manju. jeans. And like her little, I don't know, it's her satiny chiffon, yes. uh, you know, blouses. And, and obviously I've met cousin Manju and she's, she's now older, you know, she's a cool girl. And uh, like- How do you win her trust to talk to you though? I mean, how do you, how do you establish that rapport? Is it something that just happened naturally? Was, it, was she always open to talking to you? So, uh, you know, if tracking down cousin Manju was a little, uh, little bit, uh, of a tricky situation, yeah. um, you know, in the, the parents were under so much pressure to create a profile, the pressure that I don't know if they, how much they put on themselves and how much they felt from others. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they felt a tremendous amount from other people, but they were definitely under pressure to create profiles of these perfect children. Um, and one of the things that they were really, uncomfortable about talking was the fact that the kids had gone to a mela. And you know, this is the most shattering thing, Alok. I mean, you, you are under so much pressure from wherever that you can't even, you're afraid to say my kids went to a mela. What is a mela? 
I mean, seriously, there is a, there's literally, I've been to that Mela, there is a Ferris wheel. There is, there are gold guppas, there are toys, there's nothing. It is most innocent, sweet, and it's nothing. And they were, the parents didn't want to admit. You know, so initially, if you look at some of the early news reports, it says, no, no, my, my kids didn't go to a Mela, or even we don't have Melas. Is the shame attached to the idea that the kids were having fun or the kids were on their own and they were autonomous? They were autonomous. They were on their own. They had been allowed to leave the boundaries of the village. They were doing something that girls are not supposed to do on their own. You know, if, I mean, this, these were 16 and 14 year old children and the Mela was literally walking just across the street, you know, a tiny little Mela. But the parents were afraid to admit it. And so when I found out that cousin Manju had accompanied the kids, I said, hey, you know, I'd love to talk to cousin Manju. And it wasn't something that they were happy to do. And I had to wait years, I feel. It was not months to, you know, to find again, approach, uh, find the right time. Because the first time I asked it, uh, you know, it, it created a lot of unrest from um, uh, from family members uh, and then I had to wait and and it was finally uh, Lali's brother her oldest brother Virinda who lives in Noida who said no no take her number and so then I went to Noida to meet cousin Manju and she was very she was very straightforward very forthright young woman and uh, who also, in I think a typical way of teenagers, was still nursing some bruises of having been rejected, uh, of having been snubbed by her older cousins. And so therefore felt uh, you know, quite free to say things to me that she perhaps uh, might not have said under other circumstances. How fascinating. I mean, you know, and this, you know, and you handle, and I, I, I don't want to give away the story at all, but for me, this, on the theme of autonomy. <laughs> Sorry, somebody's mic. I'm sorry, Mr. Carlos, you just put some music on. <laughs> you don't want to be that autonomous. Fun of Zoom, isn't it? <laughs> no, I think you handle, you handle. You handle you in the book. Are we getting? Uh, are we getting spammed, guys? Somebody's spamming us. We're getting spammed by some South American kids. I'm sorry. I apologize. No worries. No, I really, I really like to. You know, I love the way how delicately you you handle the issue of adolescent sexuality in the book. Because it's sort of, it's done. What is happening, guys? Uh, Reggie, are you there? Can you help me with this? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think, that, you know, for me, from a queer and feminist perspective, and also for, in line with the beautiful, beautiful thing, I loved how the book was also a really strong sort of a testimony to uh, adolescent sexuality mm -hmm. and how that autonomy, I mean, and that's how I kind of, I, I took a part of it for me in, in my head because I mean, despite everything, despite everything that you see in that rural life, kids are able to exercise that adolescent, adolescent sexuality, whether there are repercussions attached to it, I get it, but there is the exercise of it. And I think the very fact that exercise was, away, was there, sort of for me, was almost a sort of a, you know, it's it's it gives dignity to your life to the, to, the, to to a, oh my God, you're getting you're having a problem. Here. I'm gonna remove these. Things. We've been bombarded by some people. I'm so sorry, Sonia. This is some. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, we were Zoom spam. Yeah, can you just help me, guys, please? Because we're getting Zoom Zoom spammed by a lot of people. We won't allow them in again. Okay, I'm actually going to take a uh, let's let's uh, at this moment <laughs> since we've been really been interrupted, and I think now we'll just be careful. Uh, Sonia, uh, 
I, I uh, so for the audience, I discussed with Sonia what what part of book should we read, and I think because it's International Women's Day today, and, and there's something really incredible that Sonia does through the book because the book constantly brings us into what's happening in India at that time, what's happening in UP at that time, brilliantly, you know, uh, and uh, and uh, whether it's uh, Will Akhilesh Yadav's struggles with his father. And uh, and Modi's coming, Modi's rise to power. Modi has just been appointed as a prime minister. So it's a constant reminder of a timeline of India when these events are taking place. But I think there's something really incredible that the book also does. It acknowledges a struggle of uh, uh, the women's of the women's rights movement, uh, which has led us to really create a sort of a language around uh, uh, protecting women from sexual violence in a way that and, and, and a long it's a long history of that uh, uh, struggle. But I thought uh, if Sonia could read from this chapter, The Women Who Changed India, and parts of it, and we can really sort of uh, also be really opposite for uh, Women's Day. Sonia, you're muted, Sonia. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. So sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'll take that from the top. The Delhi bus rape was among a handful of crimes against women that had over the years created social awareness and led to policy changes. When these changes happened, one could perhaps find comfort in the fact that at least something positive had come out of something heinous. In 1972, a teenager in the Western state of Maharashtra had walked into a police station to settle a domestic dispute and was only allowed to leave after the police officers present had sexually assaulted her. Her name was Mathura and she was an orphan who belonged to an indigenous community. The assault elicited shock, a researcher on gender, poverty and health said, because it was new for people to imagine a security personnel as a perpetrator, as a rapist. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, which accused, acquitted the accused largely on the grounds that Mathura wasn't visibly injured and didn't call for help. The decision outraged a group of four law professors who wrote a letter of protest to the Chief Justice of India. Eventually, this led to the burden of proof being shifted away from the victim. A legal amendment now states where sexual intercourse by the accused is proved and the question is whether it was without the consent of the woman alleged to have been raped. And she states in her evidence before the court that she did not consent. The court shall presume that she did not consent. This meant that a woman would be taken at her word. The punishment for custodial rape was increased and the identity of the rape victim was to be protected. This last prohibition drew attention in 2012 after the media resorted to using a variety of lionizing pseudonyms for the Delhi bus rape victim. The Hindi adjectives translated into fearless, lightning and treasure. The trend only changed after her mother explicitly called for her daughter's real name to be used. Why should we hide our daughter's name? Asha Devi said. My daughter was not at fault. And by hiding crimes, we only allow more crimes to take place. We are proud of our daughter. She got immortalized as Nirbhaya, but we also want the society to know the girl we raised before she was violated by a few devilish men. Memories are painful, but her name will serve as a reminder to the society to never let such things reoccur. Two decades after the attack on Mathura in September 1992, a grassroots women's activist named Bhawari Devi was raped by a group of Gujars, the dominant caste in her village, for campaigning against child marriage in Rajasthan, a state that shares a border with Uttar Pradesh. Bhawari Devi had herself been married off when she was five or six to a boy of eight or nine. Now she had tried to prevent the village men from marrying off a baby. After her gang rape, instead of staying quiet as women were told to at the time, Bhavri Devi risked social ostracism by going public with her accusations. She mobilized support from women's rights activists in cities like Delhi, and they helped her take the case forward. Over the course of the trial, reported the BBC, judges were inexplicably changed five times. Three years later, in November 1995, the accused was acquitted of rape on grounds such as a member of the higher caste cannot rape a lower caste woman because of reasons of purity. 
The judgment caused outrage and led to protests across the state. But although it was challenged in the Rajasthan High Court, only one hearing has ever been held. As the rape was a direct outcome of her work, the activists who supported Pavri Devi then filed a public interest litigation in the Supreme Court, arguing that freedom from sexual assault, sexual harassment, sorry, in the workplace was a fundamental right. The outcome of their campaign was a set of rules known as the Vishaka Guidelines. In 2013, these rules became the foundation of a law to prevent sexual harassment of women at the workplace. Bhavri Devi continues to live in the same village as her attackers. They had married off the baby the day after she intervened. Like the attack on Mathura, Bhavri Devi and the victim of the Delhi bus rape, the case of Padma and Lalli became widely known. It had set of protests that had attracted powerful politicians. The question on many people's lips in Katra and beyond was this, would it inspire change? Thank you so much, Sonia. Just, I'll take a moment here just to tell the audience that uh, we are co-organizing this event with Champaka Bookstore. It's a fantastic small book sh bookshop in Bangalore. And you can order the books online from Champaka. And I think Radhika from Champaka and some other people, folks from Champaka are also in the audience. And maybe we can bring them up uh, uh, during the question and answer. So really, I, I got the book from Champaka. So I really encourage people to order the book from Champaka. It's a fantastic book because it really helps us understand uh, not just the story of Padma and Lali, but also understand the sort of the, the ecosystem in which the story has emerged. And on that point itself, Sonia, for me, it really interests me. Why don't we have more writing of this kind in the country? We, we don't actually see a lot of Indian authors taking up this kind of non, uh, non-fiction investigative work. I mean, we have, uh, in many ways, I think your work is quite rare. It's ex it's exceptional. I mean, you're creating a public record of a very important incident that happened by combining oral histories and government records. And, you know, it's, a, it's an exercise you see activists taking and writing reports. I don't see it may, often done in, in forms of books, uh, modern books, of modern history of India. I mean, this is really a modern history of our country. And, uh, and I mean, it's sort of, were you, did you, did you feel that uh, you were entering into a, sort of charting out a territory that, that was, didn't really, I mean, were the pub, did you have a lot of support? Were the publishers okay with it? I mean, were there reservations around this? No, 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 never. No, I've been really, really lucky with uh, Beautiful Thing and with The Good Girls. Um, you know, uh, with Beautiful Thing, so I'd written a novel first, right? I'd written a novel called The Girl, and after it was published, I was like, oh, wow, I really can't write novels. <laughs> never repeat this mistake again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and for me, at that same time, I was having having this sort of like awakening, you know, my, I was sort of, um, I I'd understood finally, uh, quite late in my life, actually, in my, in my mid twenties, my place in the world and how I wanted, who I wanted to be and who I wanted to be was somebody who responded to the world, who participated in conversations, who found out things for myself, uh, who just try to understand things directly rather than you know, absorbing secondhand information. And that was something that I could actually easily do because I was a reporter uh, in Bombay. And you know, it's, people want to talk to reporters, traveling uh, certainly at the time was, was affordable. And uh, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't a challenging thing. And at the same time, it was really invigorating and made me feel excited about the possibilities. And with those two combined, you know, the sense that, oh, wait, I, I can't write novels and here's something that I want to do, that combined in sort of pushing me towards reportage. And when I started thinking about publishing Beautiful Thing, uh, you know, it, it, I also have that sense of, look, uh, I can't, like I have to succeed with this book because otherwise I'm just somebody who's publishing not good books. And, uh, you know, I mean, then I need like a fallback profession, right? <laughs> so, uh, so because I was afraid and I think, you know, fear is a defining, it's, it's actually a very defining characteristic of my personality and also of my work uh, because I have uh, so much fear. That is what... Uh, pushes me to, 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 to keep reporting and to keep rewriting so that I get it just right. 
You know, so fear has been a very useful attribute for me. And because I was afraid that I, that I, um, I might get this wrong as well, I spent as much time as I needed. And at the time, um, I don't know if you would know Ravi Singh. Oh, no, I don't know Ravi Singh, no. Okay, Ravi Singh, you know, iconic Penguin publisher who's now with Speaking Tiger, was somebody who supported me while I was writing Beautiful Thing. He was, of course, in Delhi and I was in Bombay. But about once a year, he would just call me and say, oh, how's the book going? And just knowing that somebody cared about this wow. these words that were not anything at the time was very, uh, was wonderful for me, you know, as, a, as a, an, an early career writer. So on the one hand, I put a lot of pressure on myself to get it right and take all the time I needed. And on the other hand, I had at least one person, I mean, of course, apart from family and friends, who, were very, who was very supportive and encouraging. Can you quantify both these research projects? Like, for example, in both uh, uh, Beautiful Thing and The Good Girls, how many people did you interview? Like, how many times did you travel to Uttar Pradesh? Uh, just, just, just for The Good Girls, how many people did you interview in, 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 in total? How many trips did you make to the village in, uh, the, uh, to Katra? Um, how long did this entire period take? When did you conclude the research and you sat down to, you sat down to write? Can you quantify some of these things? Let's see the scale of work you put yourself through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in 2014, in the summer, after I saw the picture of the children, I started to think about making that a centerpiece of a book about sexual assault. But, you know, centerpiece in the sense I it was really still going to be a small part of the book. And I really did believe that because it was a so-called open and shut case, I could make one trip to Katra and then I would write the book, right? The book was this big and the case was supposed to be that, that's a part of it. Um, so I first went to Katra in 2015 and I was going to stay there for a week. And at the end of the week, I was not, I didn't have, you know, again, fear, the fear that look, all the investigations have concluded, but I'm not confident that I know what happened and I cannot have this in my book. So either I do not have it in my book or I stick around. And so again, you know, the sense that look in India, you never, you're never sure. You know, ultimately, the, we think that the Katra case is unique, but the Katra case is not dissimilar to the case of, you know, uh, the, the Bollywood actress Jia Khan, who was found hanging in her apartment, you know, and the, a lot of people say, uh, well, a lot of people, I mean, investigations, investigators say she died by suicide, her family says something else, you know, or, or in the case of um, I'm, I'm sorry, this high profile celebrity wife, I feel so bad, I don't remember her name, but who died uh, apparently by consuming pills. And, uh, you know, again, two stories. So this lack of nobody knows what happened is across the board, right? So I said, I might as well stick with this case. So I kept going back uh, to Katra from 2015 to 2018. Two years. Yeah, and in that time, uh, 15, 16, 17, no, I kept four years because I was going in 2018 as well. Um, and you I, were based in London at that time, so you would constantly make trips to India and then go to Katra. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I developed a routine. I would take a direct flight to Delhi and uh, then there would be a car waiting for me from my usual um, you know, car service that I use. And I would drive six hours to this hotel that I was staying in, and uh, which is in uh, Badanyu. And from the hotel, it's another two hours to the village, uh, to Katra Sabukanj. So it would be very, very long days uh, because of, of the extra bit of travel that was included. Uh, I started working in Katra, but because of the unique circumstances of the case, I kept moving further and further away. And also a lot of the people that I wanted to interview, Alok, had been, had moved. Transferred, you know, yeah, yes. Of course, all the five police chalky officers were transferred. A lot of the senior officers were transferred. The investigators, of course, were not living in that district. Um, so I interviewed about uh, 100 people or maybe slightly over 100 people. And then I was given access by Padman Lali's parents to the CBI investigation files to which they had petitioned the court. And I have those files with me. Uh, they are um, over, uh, I think they're about 3,200 pages. I'm not sure of the exact number. So I also had those files. 
And the files were really heavy reading, um, you know, because they are in Hindi, a lot of them. And of course, I read Hindi, but slower than I read English. So the files were a bit of a, um, a bit of like wading. Investigation files didn't give you confidence in the system. Did it, was it was it thorough? Did you feel because you kind of acknowledge in book, the book constantly that some of the things that we don't understand is actually the police was doing its job to the best of their abilities. Yeah. And yeah, so, you know, there were there were some sort of striking issues with the files in which uh, that is, you know, because they're, they're full of interview transcripts. Hmm. You know, m- more than 200 people were interviewed uh, by the, the investigators. So it, there were certain quite startling things uh, that were said in these transcripts. And initially, when I took those transcripts back to the family and said, look, you are quoted as having said or done this. Can you please confirm? Because I, you know, I can't, I can't not get a rebuttal, right? If I'm going to say something, uh, if I'm going to say X, Y, Z has said something, they have to be given the opportunity for a rebuttal, especially since I'm actually in conversation with them. Uh, and, and so initially they would say, no, we didn't. And, um, the CBI is lying and the CBI, uh, you know, took bribes and they made a lot of uh, quite disturbing allegations. And again, I, I understand the, 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 the reason why they would say and do certain things. But as, as you find out in the book, when that happened, uh, you know, it became necessary to then go to a third person who was an eyewitness. Yeah. Uh, to that particular event, and then to get the third person to confirm who, in this case, was being fully honest. Was it was it the individual speaking to the CBI or the individual speaking to me? Because sometimes the stories were were dissimilar. And, and, I, and I just want to say for the audience, because the, the, the book is not just the investigation or, or, or sort of unraveling of uh, the death of uh, uh, Padma Ali, but it's also the unraveling of the afterlife of the death, because there are just multiple events after the uh, after the death, that are constantly the, that you really unravel. So, I mean, I can just imagine the level of research and the level of inquiry that has gone in is just incredibly deep. And then you weave it into a crime, it's a page turner crime thriller because uh, you just, uh, it's just incredible because you sort of, uh, it's, it's fascinating how you put it together. Uh, I mean, I, we have a few, uh, I'm, I'm going to soon uh, move to a question answer, but I wanted to conclude now with, I mean, the main theme of the book, which I kind of, I thought we'd discuss in the end, which mm-hmm. is the really strong political theme that you, you've discussed through the book, which is uh, the sort of, the, 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 this entire idea of honor killings, this idea of, of, uh, of justified. I mean, you know, I, I'm, th- I'm thinking, I'm redefining the idea of honor killing, this permissible killings, the permissible deaths, you know, that, deaths that are justified. And, uh, and, and, you know, and that's the theme that is constantly in the book. And, and that's one thing that stays right till the end. And, 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 you, and you touch it again and again and again. And, uh, and it really disturbs me because, uh, and I, I thought I'll actually ask you something else because while you were in, you spent so much time in rural UP and the current news that's coming out of UP is about love jihad because, uh, and I, that's really, the most important issue that's really the idea that the government has actually legislated uh, a sort of a, a, a cup and chai diktat into into law and uh, and you know sometimes as as a political activist i wonder uh, are we are we heading into these dark days where very soon we will start uh, do you you know are they going to i mean honor killings as an idea in, just in Pakistan, for example, in many uh, jurisprudential spaces, is a defense. I mean, it's very disturbing now whether the government of India will actually, or the government of UP will stand up against honor killings. And I, if you really see, there is not, there is no real reprimand about honor killings. You know, yeah. it happens, but there's no real, there's no, no, like Modi has not come out and made a statement against honor killings. Yogi Adityanath is not going to come out and make a statement against honor killings. So, and and as you say in the book, these are not exceptional circumstances. These, these stories are actually, if you look for it, there are hundreds of stories like this. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of stories like this. So I, I'd really like you to talk a little bit about what you understood about the sort of deep idea of protecting the honor. Yeah. And- look, I mean, I, I say this a lot because I think people forget that, you know, you can love somebody, but you can hurt them. 
You can love somebody, but you can still refuse to do what's best for them. You can love somebody, but you can still prioritize your survival over theirs. So it's not an issue of whether girls or daughters or wives uh, or children in general are less loved in our culture than they are in other cultures. They are loved just as much. They are just not a priority. You know, uh, ultimately we, many of us have, uh, either we have, uh, we are in situations where we have too little and when you have too little, then you begin to have an obsessive focus on what you, an, an understandably obsessive focus on what you do possess. And one of the things that you do possess is, is honor, it is dignity, it is your word, it is those sort of things, they take priority over everything else. And you see the same thing at the other end of the spectrum. When you have a lot to lose, then again, you know, you are very, very careful and, and tend to prioritize certain things over perhaps what is what is even humane. And I think that that's the issue that we are facing. It is that, that you know, these victims are simply low priority. There's love, but there's low priority. Some other things are, are high priority. And because we are sort of enmeshed in this hierarchical system uh, of caste, of class, uh, and, and it doesn't benefit people who are in power to try and dismantle any aspect of the system, the system just continues to go on. And you know, the victims tend to be girls and women. And uh, again, because of their low priority, nothing changes. So what we need is, you know, we need more powerful people who look more powerful, women in powerful positions with a more humane understanding of what the world should look like. And, uh, you know, an understanding full stop of what human rights look like. Is, so is honor killings a kind of a sacrifice? Is it, is, is it a, it's like a, a, it's not a religious sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice to the Samaj. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's definitely, I think, one way of looking at it. I mean, it's a sacrifice to the Samaj. So you, so you can, because, you know, in, in a, uh, you sacrifice, you can sacrifice an animal you love, right? You sac in fact, yep. you have sacrifices, you love something and you sacrifice it. So here you're sacrificing something you daily love and you're sacrificing it for the protection of the Samaj because, because you, you need to, you, your survival depends on you surviving with your, you belonging to the Samaj. And that is, right. so and right. I think you know, and, and the, the person who is doing the sacrifice will make the argument uh, that they're not doing it for themselves alone, that they're doing it on behalf of their family, the other girls and women in their family, and for their community, their 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 clan, and future generations. So it really comes down to, yes, uh, it is a terrible thing, but it is one person, and look at everybody else who is, you know, not suffering as a uh, as a consequence. But what's happening is that, you know, there are more and more reasons to commit these crimes. So from premarital sex, to, to, to um, marrying outside your religion, to marrying outside your caste, to really just doing anything that uh, is, is different from what is considered uh, acceptable. For me, one of the greatest beauties of the book, and I really want to thank you for it, is to, you know, you've really evoked Padma, Lali as, Padma and Lali, Lali as both I mean, these incredibly intelligent girls who, uh, and, and, and as you said, you know, these adolescent girls with an afterlife who had mischief in their life and who, 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 who were attracted to boys and wanted to, you know, meet boys and, and wanted to go to Melas. At the same time, at that young age, shared that deep fear of the Samaj. Yeah. I mean, and it, you know, that, at that young age to have that deep understanding that in the end, my life is not that important in relation to the honor of the family and the Samaj. And I think that for me comes out so incredibly powerfully in the book, which is when, once again to the audience, I wanna say that if there's one book you will read this year, please read The Good Girls, because it is really as, um, I, I just, you know, uh, I mean, I know a, a great, Abhijit Banerjee, Banerjee says, The Good Girls left me shattered. And I, I, I echo it, it left me shattered. So, I mean, it's really, and it's and precisely for that reason, because, and I come back to what I started earlier in the beginning of the discussion, that you really evoked Padma Lali for the for us. And I think that is, and I, and I, obviously I want to congratulate you, but I also want to, maybe as a last comment, you know, 
you say that you kind of you were riddled with fear and self doubt. You know, a lot of us are riddled with fear and self doubt in our work, but with that fear and self doubt, you you created this character of Padma Lali that you actually never met, and uh, and um, uh, maybe sort of you know. Uh, and do you do you feel like you really know them very well now? Maybe I guess. Um, I know I, I can't say that. Um, I, I I would I would hesitate to to um, I would hesitate to say that. But I, I did my best to um, you know to to help people understand who they were and what they might have been and what we as a community and as a country have lost. When when you lose kids, you don't just lose those two kids, right? I mean, you do of course, but they represent everything. They represent our future. And we are just chipping away at our own future by losing our own kids. And, and, and also by bringing them up with this idea that they don't really matter. <laughs> what, yeah. what kind of world are we preparing them for, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I, I promised Sonia that I was going to stick to time. And, uh, in our, and I'm so happy that Sonia allowed me to sort of have my ramble discussion about the process of her thinking. And thank you so much for sharing some of that process with us, Sonia. We have a, a, a nice little audience today with us. And I would actually like to ask uh, uh, some people to like, Radhika is here. Hi, Radhika is here from uh, Champuka. Radhika, could you actually, would you like to just come and say hello to us, Radhika? It'd be lovely if you just put your camera on and say hello. So we can actually introduce Champuka. Uh, Bipin Aswatwar is here, who is a very dear friend of mine, and who told me actually that he uh, he sort of read uh, some of the stuff for you, and he's actually thanked in the book. Yes, yes, Bipin, hi. He's just, <laughs> oh my gosh, Bipin co-wrote this book, basically. Really? <laughs> hi, Bipin is there. <laughs> Bipin. <laughs> no, no, I, I think that's, hey, that's very you? generous. Uh, Sonia, just, just two quick thoughts, Alok, before Radhika jumps in, right? And I, I'm a huge crime fiction and non-fiction buff. And when I was reading the manuscript, I think I read it in a hurry, tearing hurry for the first time because I wanted to know what happened. And then Sonia had some follow-up questions on some parts and I said, look, I need to go back and read those again because I was just sort of, uh, it was gripping. And to nar narrate non-fiction in this manner, which is interesting, which is also making a larger point, I think that's, that's a gift, Sonia. And thank you. Thank you for sharing that with all of us here. Thank you for all your help. Sorry for all the emails, the messages. <laughs> Thank you so much for your help. Yeah, Bipin messaged me this afternoon saying, "By the way, look at the acknowledgments. I'm thanked." And in the second second line, <laughs> I was like, "I was like, I was thanked in the first book." <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing! Amazing! Like, I'm I'm very... <laughs> but um, um, so, did we see Radhika? Not really. Okay, but uh, I think uh, so. Hi. How challenge? Okay, we have questions. With their money, how challenging was it to combine the reporting of a true crime and the writing of it as narrative nonfiction? Actually, that's a really great question. Yeah. So um, I didn't think of it as a book of true crime. Uh, that came much later. This was actually the idea of my publishers. So I simply wrote uh, the book that I wanted to write. Um, and, and, you know, wrote it in a linear fashion, because that is just like a fundamental of, uh, of journalism, you know, if you want to explain something complex to, uh, to your audience, you just start at the very beginning. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental, and it seems like a really easy thing to do, but it becomes so complex when there are dozens of people involved. And in this particular case, you know, everybody uh, thinks that they saw or heard something different, um, which kind of created this, uh, which gave it the sense of, of uh, I, I guess, of a suspenseful true crime. But, um, but I, I didn't really think of it as anything but a book about... Uh, these two children who had been found hanging in a tree and about what might have led them um, to end up there. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, <clears throat> let me see if I have any, any other questions of the audience guys? It was quite shy audience today. So, mm -hmm. so I just, uh, 
You talk about, you know, it's really interesting for me. I, for, I, I've been doing some research and I, I, I study the National Crime Records Bureau uh, reports a lot. And, and mm -hmm. I was really interesting because as a really good investigator, you've really brought in a lot of data from the NCRB. And I was wondering, actually, it'd be really interesting to actually do the re, uh, a history of the NCRB itself needs to be written. Mm -hmm. How NCRB has responded to political movements uh, in the last decades, and uh, and and you know, and that shaped the report, the nature of the report that comes out. For example, if you look at the report now, it's actually very detailed. Yeah, yeah, fact, it is. The fact that now it actually and and, and I'll only learn this from your book because I, that it actually identifies honor killings as honor killings. Yes, you know, yes, it's, it's a honor killings. Yeah, and that's very really interesting. So now we actually have a category in the country in that, a national crime record that we have honor killings. And something that I don't think was present a few decades ago, or no. like, might have been a few years ago, and in it, that itself is testimony uh, testament to both, uh, uh, you know, politics and, and the way in which the conversation ha conversations are happening. Um, so I'd like you to really just sort of, I mean, for me, my last uh, sort of uh, question to you is. How do we create more such narratives? How do we encourage this kind of writing about the country, a modern writing about modern India, real modern India in this way, uh, where people, uh, and, and why do we not see enough of it in the country? So I think we see some really amazing writing um, in places like Article 14. I just think their work is- I mean, Journalism um, I see, but not in, not in yes. a book. No, 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 no. Yeah, absolutely. So you do have this incredible writing in a, a journalistic short uh, format, right? Article 14, wire, scroll, a three, caravan, of course, uh, for examples. I, I think, though, that we do need to offer financial support. If you're going to ask a reporter to dedicate four or five years of their life or even a year of their life to this sort of intensive digging where this becomes the priority and the focus of their life, you have to offer them financial support. And in a lot of places, and well, I, I shouldn't say a lot, but you know, America is a good place where you reporters have a, a vast pool of grants that they can access, you know, from micro grants that are a few hundred or a few thousand dollars to much larger uh, fellowships that will support them while they're writing the book. So for Beautiful Thing, for example, I didn't receive any support at all. And I was able to write the book while I was freelancing because it was felt to me like it was all happening just outside my window, you know, so I really didn't have any, I mean, I was already living in Bombay and it wasn't a lot of money to, to take the train to Mira Road and it, I just didn't spend a lot of money and I could do two things at one time. But again, with Beautiful Thing, I couldn't get, a, you know, a fellowship to support my work. And that's, and I used basically my advance to fund my, my, my time and my travels. So that's not feasible for everybody and nor should, that is not what advance is for in any case, you know? And so I think that we have some remarkable writers doing extraordinary work. And I think that uh, publishers and editors and funding agencies should come together to create a more robust set of fellowships that support writing. But you know, that is only going to happen if you believe that writing and books and truth matter. So since we are in an, an unfortunate descent where, you know, truth doesn't matter so much as, uh, you know, managing the narrative, I, I'm, I'm not super optimistic. And yet at the same time, we have so many great journalists that it's, it's impossible also to be pessimistic. And, and I hope they find many of the early career journalists find a way, uh, you know, to write the books that they feel are important. So in many ways, the Good Girls is a really great beacon of hope at the time where, uh, uh, you know, as we say, the Godi media is taking over our journalism to see this kind of really like, sort of true, true to the soil journalism and this kind of incredible investigative work that you've spent over five years researching and writing. It's incredible. And I think that's a great inspiration to everyone. Uh, we have actually a, a last comment, sorry. Uh, narrative nonfiction seems to be, this is from Matt, narrative nonfiction seems to be coming to Petish shape in India over the last decade or so from beautiful things, a free man to dreamers, mm -hmm. while writing such books, how do you balance the need to focus on the core story along with the broader national themes? And the second question, shall I also repeat, read out the last question, next question? 
Could you give us an insight into the approach you take when starting to report on a story? This is from Vivan. How do, how do you engage with the community initially and explain who you are and what you're trying to do? Oh, good question as well. Um, sorry, what was, uh, what was Matt's question? Yes. I just remember the names of the books, which are all great. <laughs> narrative, non narrative nonfiction seems to be coming to better shape in India over the last decade. From Beautiful Thing, Free Man to Dreamers, while writing such books, how do you balance the need to focus on the uh -huh. story along with the broader national themes? Something yeah. fantastically in The Good Girls, actually. It's, oh. That's what I love about it because it sort of brings us into the context of the whole country at that time, yeah. Thank you. So it, it really happens uh, for me through drafts. And I, I suspect other reporters might do a better job sooner. But, uh, you know, in the first draft of the book, I focused just on the case. In the second draft, I went way, way back into uh, the history of Badayu, really all the way back. I mean, further back than the British. And so um, it, it was only, I think, in the third draft of the book that I reached the point that we are at now, I, I reached, you know, I got the skeleton of the current version and then kept refining it. So for me, it's, it's, it's just um, constantly rewriting that gets, uh, that gets me to um, integrate all the various strands of the book. And uh, Vivan's question was also really, really good. And um, I think I, 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 I went to Katra, I introduced myself, I, I told uh, the family of the girls who I was, where I was coming from, why I found the story compelling and what I wanted to do with it. And initially I didn't know that it would be a book only about uh, you know, what had happened to their children and that changed later on. But um, I think you know, often people are not that interested in, in who the reporter is beyond establishing that they, that reporter is trustworthy. And I think the lack of trust in Indian journalists is something that a lot of us um, are, are, are having to deal with. You know, I mean, even in a place like Katra where the, the Shakya family doesn't have access to television and to the newspapers, they know that there are TV stations and there are newspapers that misreport the facts and, and as a result cause extremely unpleasant situations for people, you know. So um, I think building trust also comes from just establishing that I'm a serious journalist who is there to understand really what happened. Um, and, uh, but also I had to make it very clear that I wouldn't just be speaking to them, that I was there to speak to as many people as, as I felt were necessary to tell the story. Thank you, thank you for that, Sonia. Guys, if it's 8.32, uh, Sonia, will any percentage of your earnings be passed on to the two girls' parents, Louis Godino? You, uh, you don't have to answer that question if you don't want to, we don't need to know this, but anyway. <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks so much, yeah. Uh, uh, so, May I ask you one last question, Sonia? Just to take mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Tell us the, I'm sure there was one moment when you were tearing your head apart and saying, oh my God, what have I got myself into? <laughs> I can't do this. This is just, a, this is not moving forward. And yeah, I think we were here. Yeah. That kind of real block, whether it's from like getting people to speak to you, whether getting some permission, whether things are not really coming together. Uh, that one, one, one experience of deep frustration in the middle of a deep writing process. Yes, I had a lot of those, especially, you know, um, 2018, 2019, there was a lot of information, a lot of strands of the story. I really, I really struggled with it and, and went through quite a few dark days. Um, but you know, you, you have to see a book till the end, right? I mean, that's what makes an author as opposed to somebody who has a good idea, or somebody who has talent or somebody who's hardworking. I mean, the thing is that everything has to come together um, and, and the book has to be finished. That, that's just it. There's no way out of it. So you can finish the book by writing every single day and trying to overcome the, all those voices in your head uh, and all the struggles. Um, or you can just say, look, I can't do it. And I, I, I was not in a position to give up, right? I, I'd, I'd come too far. But 
actually, Alok, one of the reasons that I founded, um, I formed a, a fellowship, a, 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 um, a mentorship program for writers in South Asia. It's an early career mentorship program called South Asia Speaks. And I started it last year. Oh, we have, yeah, we have 20 amazing authors. We have um, uh, uh, Saman Subramanian, Fatima Bhutto. We have um, another Goan resident, Prayag Akbar. Oh, Prayag oh, so lovely. Yeah, <laughs> Karan Mahajan, lots of, uh, you know, Madhuri Vijay, lots and lots of incredible people. And so 20 authors who are volunteering their time to work with early career writers. So it's called South Asia Speaks, and uh, it was launched last year. Yep. And we got like... 500 uh, applications, really, really yes. amazing applications wow, great from eight business. countries. And part of the impetus of founding that fellowship was, it's mentorship, sorry, was understanding and remembering all too keenly that writing is lonely and that it's a struggle and that, you know, we all need to support each other as much as possible. So, uh, uh, yeah, so trust me, it's hard and, and, <laughs> Hey, but it's, you know, you can do it. So, so dear, thank you so much for what a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Oh, there's one last, sorry. I'm going to say this, Reggie, that is the case still being deliberated in the court? No, it's, it's the case has been closed, Reggie. Uh, well, uh, th there are actually two, two, uh, two things that are happening. One is that, uh, you know, uh, Papu Yadav uh, does have to face certain charges. And the other is that, you know, his family, uh, the, the family of the children is pursuing a case against him and certain other people. On statutory rape? Uh, on more than that, on, on several, uh, several charges that they believe to be true. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks for the clarification. So, guys, once again, the good girls. We had a great time talking to Sonia today. Please order the book on Champaka.in, a fantastic store from Bangalore that I love very much. And Radhika is in the audience, but we don't see Radhika today. It doesn't matter. Please, please order the book from the, uh, Champaka and, and uh, get a copy. And thank you, Sonia, so much for making time to speak to us. Thank you so much for taking us through the process. Thank you for a fantastic audience. Uh, this, uh, uh, we've recorded our entire conversation on YouTube live. It should be on the Dust channel. And, uh, and, uh, and, and yes, and you can also make a small donation to Dust if you feel like it. <laughs> the link is on our website. So have a lovely day, Sonia. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Alok, you. thank you so much. Thanks, Champaka. Thank you, Dust. And thank you to everybody who's watching. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.